I'm a member of the program committee for OLLI, or Share Lifelong Learning Institute, and I'm delighted you're here today because I think we're in for a real treat. I, uh, until I met him this afternoon, didn't know Dr. Meter, but I've heard of him, his reputation, I've, I've heard of him for decades, I think. Um, <laughs> So I'm delighted that he's finally here. He has spoken at many other OLLI groups uh, throughout the state and been extremely well received. So let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a University Distinguished Professor of German and Folklore at UVM, where he just told me he's aiming for 50 years at, a, at UVM, which will happen in, what you say, six years, four, four years? Only four. <laughs> okay, 44 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. He served as chair of the Department of German and Russian for over three decades, and he's received a number of awards for his teaching and scholarship, including uh, honorary doctorates from the universities of Athens and Bucharest. While his research ranges from fairy tales, legends, and folk songs to philological studies, his special expertise lies in the area of international study of proverbs. And I learned a new word that I want to share with you because I've never heard this word. It's paramiology. Paramiology. Very good. And that's, what, that's Dr. Meter's specialty, and he'll tell us all about it. But I love learning new words, so I want to share that with you. Many of his books deal with the use and function of proverbs, and there is a variety. He is a much published author, and there is a very interesting variety of books on the table here that you might look at. Uh, his books deal with the, the use and function of proverbs in literature, mass media, art, politics, and advertising. His most recent book is Behold the Proverbs of a People, Proverbial Wisdom in Culture, Literature, and Politics, and that, that book is there as well. So, uh, with, with no further ado, let me introduce... Well, a little further ado. Oh, a little further ado. <laughs> uh, my further ado is that there's a car parked illegally. Does anyone have a blue Subaru GNK300? It's parked on the side there. No. Okay. Well, never mind. No <laughs> more. <laughs> yes. I was just like, can you let people know what bed next week? Okay. Yes, that's a good idea. And before we start this week, we will let you know that next week we will be, yeah, oh, in for another treat of a totally different sort. We will be in Barrie, and we will have. Um, Mary Bonhag and Evan Primo, who are nationally and internationally known musicians who happen to live in our midst, talking about um, making music and raising a family <laughs> in Barry. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, thank you, Edie, for the, for those for those nice words and for your. Quick, just quicker than my students, you know, in learning the word paramiology. Paramiology is, is not such a hard word. It's Greek, and paramia means proverb in Greek. So basically, uh, we have picked the Latin word to dis for in English to use proverb. But if you want to be fancy and talk about the science of studying wisdom and proverbs, then you go back to Greek. You use the Greek word for proverb, which is paremia, and then you can make ology, the study of, and voila, you have paremiology. Well, I'm glad and honored to talk to you. Uh, I was with the uh, Montpelier Oli group. I looked it up. I can even give you the date. On September 21st, 2011, we met up at the uh, Montpelier at the college. And I know I met Bob there, and, and, and I talked about proverbs in advertising and so on at the time, and, 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 and thoroughly enjoyed it. I want, to, I want to thank Edie, first of all, for, for her nice remarks. But um, I would like to dedicate uh, this talk to two people whom we, and I think you all knew both of them, uh, have just lost. Uh, there's, first of all, Ben Scotch 
who uh, was a dear friend of mine, and uh, Ben and I served on the UVM Center for Holocaust Studies for, for many, many years. From, I, uh, Barbara, I would say from about 1993 on. And uh, so uh, uh, Bob was always the most impressive uh, partner with great ideas, uh, a lot of uh, willingness to once in a while discuss a problem that was not necessarily popular. Uh, and he could do that with charm and, 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 and humor and so on. So we'll, we'll miss uh, Ben a great deal. And the other good friend is Haley Ballantyne, and that I only found out as I arrived here today. Uh, Haley, I have known Haley, or knew Haley, at least for 45 years. I, I got to know Haley the minute I arrived at UVM in 1971. And she, of course, was a German teacher, so as you can imagine, we had uh, strong ties also with her husband. So I'm very sad to, to find out that Haiti has passed away, and I will have to carry that back to my German colleagues at UBM, because we all do Haiti and her family very well. Okay, anyhow, leaving that sad thought behind us, uh, what I would like to do today is, last time, or sometimes, when I talk to wonderful Oli people, which I, by the way, really like, it's a completely different experience for a professorial type to stand in front of people who are my age, you know? And, and, and I, I know that there are certain things I can mention to you that I'm aware of the fact that you can relate to. Our, our cultural literacy is very much the same. You know, even the Beatles nowadays, if I mention to my lovely students how much I like the Beatles, that doesn't belong to their growing up. I mean, I, I remember in the early 60s when I'd just come to America, I remember in college how we were literally waiting for the next Beatles song to appear. You know? And then of course we didn't have record players, so you had to have someone who had the record, someone who had a record player. I remember my roommate, uh, uh, had a record player and he was more lucky with young ladies than I was, so he always had dates and I always was a nerd and stayed at home. But I could listen to Bob Dylan, <laughs> I could listen to the Beatles. So, so anyhow, it's nice to have an audience and I always enjoy adult learners in my classes. So keep in mind, once we reach that wonderful age of 65, you can study free at UVM, you know. So, uh, so that's something to keep in mind if you have the time and, and the in, in inclination. Anyhow, today I want to talk to you about only one proverb, just one, and explain to you a little bit how the proverb, all men are created equal, what it has meant to us Americans, how it developed, uh, what interpretations of it there are. Is it really as perfect as we sometimes think? And I see many ladies in the, in the crowd, so you know you might have a few problems with that particular proverb. And, and we've worked on that. What can we do about it? Why was it not more gender neutral when Jefferson came up with that wonderful statement? So I want to show you a little bit what it takes to look at one proverb. And uh, I hope you will enjoy it. And and um, uh, we'll, we'll go from there. It is no problem for me to start my comments by saying, we all know, I have to be careful at UVM that I don't say too often to my students, as you all know. I, I, I really think that's probably the biggest mistake a teacher can make, to say in a class, as you all know. They don't all know, you know, and why should they? That's why I'm there for them. But. Uh, in your case, I can say, as you all know, and the students know that too, and that is that on July 4th, 1776, we have the big Declaration of Independence in this country, right? And we all associate the Declaration of Independence with nobody else but Count Jefferson, of course. And you also recall, remember the beginning, we hold uh, these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think all of us uh, are very, very familiar with that. I'm going to put this away, because I, then I don't have to watch it. Okay, so now, yes, 
that was on the evening of the 4th of July, that was the official declaration of independence. But when you start looking how that was framed, how it was phrased originally, you actually find out that Jefferson had read, written the following. Listen closely. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation that derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are pre the preservation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you can see it really wasn't phrased quite as memorable as we know it now. And guess who gets the credit for that? John Adams. John Adams was the big stylist. So he took what I just read to you and modified it into the beautiful, memorable statement that we have now. And I, you know, you, you, I'm sure you have heard that Thomas Jefferson Adams were friends, but there was also friction. There was also a little bit of jealousy, you know, and they were fighting for who's going to become the second president, right? So uh, anyhow, and it was Abigail Adams, probably one of the brains of the founding fathers. The only problem is, as a woman, she didn't have a political voice. But she talked to John in the bedroom, and she influenced John Adams quite a bit, right? But uh, so anyhow, John Adams really was very much in, involved in it. And even Jefferson, where did Jefferson get his idea from that all men are created equal? Now notice, George Mason, about three weeks before the 4th of July, on the 12th of June, 1776, George Mason had written uh, the Virginia's Declaration of Rights. Now listen to what he in Jefferson knew that, of course. Here's what George Mason wrote three weeks before the Declaration of Independence. That all men are born equally free and independent and have certain inherent natural rights of which they cannot by any compact deprive or divert their posterity, among which are the enjoyment of life and liberty, with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Now, Jefferson knew that three weeks before he tried to formulate the Declaration of Independence. So what, you, what you're really finding out is all of us stand, what, on the shoulders of people who come before us. We do our research. We'll figure out what has X said and what might President Obama say. You know, or what has Teddy Roosevelt said? By the way, all of our presidents, for their, we know this, for their inaugural addresses, what, guess what they do? They're, they look at the previous inaugural addresses. And then they realize every former president has tried to formulate a couple, three, four sentences in those addresses that might be memorable, that they will be remembered by. Remember Kennedy asked not what your country can do for you? And by the way, that wasn't even original. He had plenty of help. So anyhow, so uh, as you can see, uh, now, I can even go further back and tell you that there was a medieval Latin proverb that goes something like this. <clears throat> we are all born equal and are distinguished alone by virtue. There are legal maxims along that line. And of course, to come up with the idea that all men are created equal is really not, I would argue, particularly unique. The uniqueness is to say it and to get away with it and to have it caught on. And then as, as we look at history to see what is the problem maybe with that statement. And we'll have some, we'll have some fun with this. Now, to get back to John Adams, he, uh, also wrote, the Consti was involved in writing the Constitution of Massachusetts, where of course he lived. So listen to this, in 1779, now he knew the new Declaration of Independence very well, but in 1779, in the Constitution of Massachusetts, he says, all men are born free and equal. Now, no notice, 
notice the tremendous linguistically, semantically, human way difference between those two statements. All men are created or born free and equal. Adams could get away with that. Remember of all the founding fathers, only Adams and Ben Franklin had no slaves. And I think, I always try to tell my students this, one thing that none of us can do, you can't and I can't, we're all partners or members of the time we live in, don't we? We can't escape that. We can try to be decent human beings in our time, and I think most of us try. But we make misjudgments, or we make, when we vote for a president, you know? We don't know whomever we vote for, what that person eventually will turn out to be, or what history will prove that person to be. So you can't escape that, right? And I would think, that Jefferson was perfectly capable of the thought that all men are born free and equal. But the time for him to say it wasn't right. It wasn't right for it. I wish he had done it. We'll get back to Lincoln about this too in a, in a moment. But anyhow, so, so, so Adams, uh, I think, deserves a little bit of credit as being one of the first who already is going a little bit beyond all men are created equal, right? by getting, getting this free element into it. Okay. Now, uh, I uh, want to show you by a few examples what, uh, how that proverb, and of course it caught on. Right? Don't forget, it only took a few days and we actually had pamphlets little um, broadsheets with the declaration on it, handed out to people in the colonies. You know. so, so people knew it. People picked it up. People reacted to it. What I want to show you in, in, in this talk is a little bit what have certain people done with it over history. And the person I want to start with is, a, is one of my real heroes. And that you, you, you probably remember this. When you were in high school, uh, there was a time in America that almost every high school student read Frederick Douglass's nar slave narrative. It's only about 45 pages long, the, the first version. Eventually he wrote two more versions, they were much longer. But anyhow, Frederick Douglass was, to my way of thinking, one of the most handsome men I've ever seen. Tall, beautiful African-American hair, uh, just an incredibly handsome man, beautiful voice as far as I have read, there are reports. He used to talk in front of nine, ten thousand people as a black man in Boston. You have to think about that in the 40s as a former slave. He never went to school, taught himself how to read, and yet contemporary of Abraham Lincoln, I've read all of his books, all of his writings, Douglas, I've done the same with uh, Lincoln. I would give Douglas the higher grade as far as rhetoric is concerned, as far as really emotive rhetoric fighting for uh, the freedom of slaves and uh, his, his speeches are just incredible, you know. So, so it was a very dear experience for me to, to read it. But let me give you an example. In 1846, at one of his rallies, he, he said the following, I do speak against an American institution. That institution is American slavery. But I love the Declaration of Independence. I believe it contains a true doctrine that all men are created equal. It is, however, because they do not carry out these principles that I'm here to speak. What a wonderful way to get people going, right? <laughs> I have a right to appeal to people everywhere. I would draw all men's attention to slavery. 
I would fix the indignant eye of the world on slavery so it be swept off the face of the earth. So he takes our beautiful, all men are created equal. It accuses the, the young nation of saying, you know, you're not living up to anything you've ever said. And people listen to him. He went to Ireland, he went to Canada, he went to Great Britain, gave speeches. If you go to Great Britain, Ireland, once in a while you see a sign, Frederick Douglass spoke here. And uh, you can take a look. I brought, I brought my book on, on, on Frederick Douglass along. Ten years later, in 1854, let me give you one more example. America stands prominently forth as a land of, inco this is kind of hits home, a land of inconsistencies and contradictions, aspiring to be honest, and yet as a nation of liars. For in her Declaration of Independence, she proclaims all men are created equal, while she holds in bondage three million and a half of her subjects, robbed of every right, deprived of every privilege, and sold and bought like beasts that perish. You, you, you can see a little bit where Martin Luther King gets his language from, don't you? And don't ever worry, I can prove to you that Martin Luther King read Frederick Douglass, that Barack Obama read Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King. Yeah. Anyhow, so that, <clears throat> that I think gives you an idea how, how <clears throat> people see that, yes, we have all these wonderful statements, but do we live up to them? And let's see how, how, how we go on. Let's turn to Lincoln. Lincoln and, Abraham, and, and, and Frederick Douglass knew each other. There's that famous anecdote that uh, President Lincoln had a reception of some type, <clears throat> and Frederick Douglass, as a black man, was invited. And supposedly, Frederick Douglass, I already mentioned to you how tall and beautiful he was, was outside. Lincoln was inside, equally tall. The doorkeeper would not let Frederick Douglass in, of course. How do you dare walk into the White House? Lincoln supposedly saw him and said, let that man in, he is my friend. A very touching uh, story, of course. Uh, now, Lincoln, at the same time, 1854, as Douglass, says the following. My, the humility of Lincoln is always just unbelievable. And if you permit me to say that, we don't have much humility right now. Uh, uh, my, my ancient faith tells me that all men are created equal, <clears throat> and there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. What I do say is that no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. I say this is the leading principle, the sheet anchor of American republicanism. Our Declaration of Independence says, and then he quotes the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. Four years, four years later, in 1858, uh, Lincoln returns to, uh, to our phrase. So I say in relation to the principle that all men are created equal, let it be as nearly reached as we can. I think this too is where Barack Obama gets his humility from. We'll, see, we'll get to President Obama in a, mo in a little while. Uh, this kind of one saying something, but also drawing back a little bit. One of Lincoln's favorite proverbs was the Bible proverb, judge not lest ye be judged. So what Lincoln will do is he will step forward, be a little bit aggressive in what he says, then he realizes, wait a minute, I might be going a little bit far. He pulls back and says, well, wait a minute here, we're not all so perfect either, right? Again, something that I think our modern politics could benefit from. Uh, so he says, so I say in relation to the principle that all men are created equal, let it be as nearly reached as we can. He's not saying that we will succeed. 
There's no exceptionalism thinking here, like unfortunately I think our politics, and not just recently, I think our American exceptionalism thinking in politics is not good for the nation. Humility is always better. Uh, and he goes on and says, let us unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. You see? He, he is touching, he's getting to the point, saying, look, it's only about 70 years later, but let's be honest with ourselves. We're not even living up to that statement. Right? I leave you, typical Lincoln, I leave you hoping that the lamp of liberty will turn in your bosoms until there shall no longer be doubt that all men are created or all free and equal. Getting ready, you know, remember we are just a few years off from the Civil War. He is not, this is very important, he is not president yet. He can still say what he thinks. Once you become president, your freedom of exactly saying what you think at times is limited. A president has to read, a president has to find, a president has to be a person of compromise, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, we'll get there. Okay, now, what, what you, what, most likely is already going through your minds is, wait a minute, Lincoln, of course, also used our proverb in the Gettysburg Address. Did any one of you still memorize the Gettysburg Address as a pupil? Yeah. 272 words, right? That was not beyond American students many years ago, <laughs> but <laughs> it, would be, it would be a tough one to expect it now. You know, I'm of the school that I don't think memorizing something once in a while is a bad idea. A poem, a song, a great statement. Uh, I, I wouldn't be a bad idea to bring memorization back, at least. Not rote, not memory, memorizing for the sake of memorizing, but maybe for carrying significant statements, uh, meaningful statements are with us. Let me refresh you. The Gettysburg Address starts with, as we know, fourscore and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Right? And beautiful start, no doubt. Fourscore, you know, score means 20. Right? So we have to, of course, explain that to sometimes. <laughs> Anyhow, he winds up this beautiful, beautiful statement. And recall that the other person who spoke in Gettysburg talked for two and a half hours. That is what was expected, a two and a half hour speech. And they can get up and get 272 words. People were flabbergasted. But it didn't take long and people realized, wow, this was the ultimate speech. Yeah. Uh, remember too, at the end he says, that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom, right? and that this government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now, I would love to come back and talk to you only about government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but that's not our topic today. But I do have to digress for a moment. Look at what Lincoln says. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. If you had to improve on it, and if you were not the president, and you could really say what you think, how would you change it? Government of the people, by the people, for the people. How could you make it stronger? What little word could you add? Government of Ah, super students sitting right there. We, we talked, we talked before, she, before we got started. <laughs> oh, now listen to this. Uh, that, that, or all, the word all. There, there was a abolition, famous abolitionist white man, white preacher, Theodore Parker. 
who had given, just like Douglas, many, many abolitionist speeches. And before Lincoln had said numerous times, government of all the people, for all the people, by all the people. Lincoln, we know that Lincoln had read. Those speeches were published as pamphlets, handed out. We know Lincoln in his library had Theodore Parker. So he knew, he knew, there's no doubt in my mind, what was needed really was to say government of all the people. Right? But Lincoln is the president. He's fighting to free the slaves. I hate to say it, he's not fighting for women yet. I hate to say it. It isn't that he's not thinking of you young ladies, but, but that's not on the agenda. So my personal belief is that Lincoln made a conscious decision not to use the all. The all was floating. Douglas used it, Theodore Parker used it, but I think President Lincoln, and I back him on that, I think President Lincoln made a conscious decision that that is something at Gettysburg. He wasn't at Gettysburg to get people riled up. He was at Gettysburg to give a beautiful statement for people who have given their life to the, to the, to the war. You know. But that kind of shows you, doesn't it? Well, we mentioned the ladies of the house. We had, of course, two great feminists in the 19th century. Frederick Douglass was their friend. Douglass lived a long life, way, way into the 1890s. So they got to know each other. Well, you know who I'm talking about. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Two absolutely fascinating women. 50 years, those two ladies fought for women's rights. 50 years. You know. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had seven children, a round little woman, kind of a little bit rotund. Uh, you've seen pictures of Susan B. Anthony with her tight hair in a little bun back here. Of course, gets you the feeling she's a bit uptight. But those two women, they crisscross the country in snow, in rain, in heat, on the train, on the horse and buggy, fought for, for, for women's rights. And uh, in 1848, on July uh, 19 and 20, 1848, not far from here, in Seneca Falls in New York, little roundish, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton gets up on the stage and gives her speech, not called Declaration of Independence, but Declaration of Sentiments. <laughs> now you have to kind of had curly hair, you know, there she stands, and she starts. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and of course we all know what's coming, that all men and women are created. So she blasts it out, you know, goes on with it, and, and uh, begins, begins what in America has been known as the early feminist uh, movement. And, uh, uh, and remember, it still took till 1920, you know, to pass the 19th Amendment for, for women's rights. And so the, the two ladies never really experienced it. Uh, and I'll, I'll, just to give Susan, Susan uh, Anthony also some credit here, uh, uh, she says, why, why is it, in the face of the utterance of our, and now she's speaking on the forefathers, why is it in the face of the utterance of our forefathers relative to all men being born free and equal? Notice she picks up on Adams. Taxation without representation, government deriving its just powers from the consent of the governs, that one half of the people are denied any voice in the workings of the government. Remember, African American males could vote, but the women couldn't, still half the population. Mm -hmm. Society upholds a false theory relative to women's place in the world, which thus makes it safe to violate these governmental maxims, our proverbs, right, as regards women. 
which no one would dare to do in the case of any class of men. The theory is that women are created primarily for men's happiness and secondarily for her own. I told my wife today I'd do anything she wants me to do. It's Valentine's Day. She laughed. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, so you can see it took, it took quite a few years till finally someone gets up and says, wait a minute here, let's change it a little bit and say all men and women are created equal. Okay, jumping, what I want to do next is show you a little bit how some of the presidents have, have dealt uh, beyond Lincoln now. Let's move, let's move to Harry Truman. Uh, Harry Truman uh, was, you know, a real straight shooter. He was, again, a man of no college education. Shows you, you don't have to have that to be a good president. So Truman, uh, on 1949, in his inaugural speech, says the following. Now remember, the war has just come to an end. George Marshall is spreading the Marshall Plan. I'm a Marshall Plan baby, so I'm very, very thankful to, to George Marshall, because I grew up with dried American milk and eggs that got us uh, uh, through the years uh, uh, after the war. The American people stand firm in the faith which has inspired this nation from the beginning. We believe that all men have a right to equal justice under law and equal opportunity to share in the common good. We believe that all men have the right to freedom of thought and expression. We believe that all men are created equal because they are created in the image of God. From this faith we will not be moved. The, now remember this is after the war. Cold War is just starting. The American people desire and are determined to work for a world in which all nations are free to govern themselves as they see fit and to achieve a decent and satisfying life. Above all else, our people desire and are determined to work for peace on earth, a just and lasting peace based on genuine agreement freely arrived among equals. That's a beautiful statement uh, after World War II, with George Marshall trying to get, especially Western Europe, uh, economically and humanely uplifted. Unfortunately, Stalin, uh, the plan with the Marshall Plan was to do the same for Eastern Europe, but Marshall put, uh, Stalin put an end to that. We, we could have avoided the Cold War if, if, if we would not have started that terrible competition between America and, 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 and the Soviet Union. But uh, Richard Nixon, uh, I, I like what Richard Nixon did in 19, said in 1969, at the time, as we all remember, at the time and height of the civil rights movement. Uh, and uh, so Nixon uh, picks up on this born again, says, as we measure what can be done, we shall promise only what we can produce. But as we chart our goals, we shall be lifted by our dreams. No man can be fully free while the neighbor is not. To go forward at all is to go forward together. This means, look at this, this is 69. Nixon was not all bad. Uh, he was actually a very smart man, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but look how it goes on. This means black and white together, as one nation, not two. The laws have caught up with our conscience. What remains is to give life to what is in the law, to ensure at last that as all are born equal in dignity before God, all are born equal in dignity before man. Again, that's a very heartwarming uh, statement, really, of, 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 of President uh, Nixon. And uh, uh, on the way over, I listened to a, a wonderful program, an interview of the Montpelier principal and a lovely young uh, Montpelier student. And I was deeply impressed by that student. She, she um, if you have a chance to listen to this interview, it happened between, well, around 12-ish, I guess, when I was driving here. And uh, I, you know, I look at this a little bit also from a linguistic, rhetorical point of view. 
She was very clear spoken. She didn't start answers by, well, you know, uh, like, uh, there was a beauty in, in, in her speech. Uh, you, you could sense her commitment to this, to this cause. And uh, the principle equally, equally well done. So there was a very, very heartwarming uh, um, uh, uh, interview. And, and, and I learned a lot. It entertained me on my whole trip down to, to Montpelier. So I was glad I, 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 I tuned in on it. Uh, anyhow, uh, let me, let me uh, go on and uh, give you uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, I think it's kind of my, my, my wife always points out to me, when you see a picture of former presidents, uh, Barbara, my wife, notices that, that Jimmy Carter always stands a little bit to the side. He's never quite integrated into the group. You know, and I think that's a shame. Uh, and uh, but maybe he is a little bit more shy than, than someone like George Bush, you know. But anyhow, uh, here's what here's what uh, President uh, Carter says: This vision still grips the imagination of the world, but we know that democracy is always an unfinished creation. Each generation must renew its foundation. Each generation must rediscover the meaning of this hollowed vision in the light of its own challenges. For this generation, ours, life is nuclear survival. Liberty is human rights. The pursuit of happiness is, is a planet whose resources are devoted to the physical and spiritual nourishments of its inhabitants. I like this unfinished creation. I was in, in, in Bucharest uh, a couple of years ago and had to give a major address. And, and I talked a little bit about American politics and proverbs. And one of the students asked me afterwards, uh, well, what, what is democracy really? And my gosh, I'm not a political scientist. But you know, as a professor, you have to be quick on your feet to answer something, even if you don't know the answer. Uh, so, so I came up with this, I came up with this to me, blatantly obvious statement, a little bit along the line of Jimmy Carter, democracy is always an unfinished creation. So I said democracy is a work in progress. I don't think they took a super brain to come up with that. But they, they, the audience just loved it. it was, people clapped and I wondered what in the world's going on here. I think in that little sentence, they somehow felt like, yeah, anyway, I guess what I was basically saying is, that democracy is not perfect. We're still working on it. You know? And that's what I meant earlier by, by saying a little bit of humility. We don't have the perfect democracy in this country. Far from it. But it certainly is something to strive towards. You know? So uh, anyhow, Bill Clinton, I'm going to pass Bill, not out of any evilness, but Bill Clinton give, basically gives a history lesson, and, and I don't think we, 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 we need this at this moment. But I want to get to Hillary. Uh, um, I would recommend reading Hillary's book, Hard Choices. Uh, uh, that I, 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 I really in, in enjoyed reading it, published in 2014, but I enjoy it for, for our talk today for a little segment in that book where she talks about, and again, some of you might remember that, although that's maybe pushing it a little bit, but anyhow, uh, the United Nations General Assembly uh, put out on December 10, 1948, a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Eleanor Roosevelt, a super lady, one of the best presidential first ladies we've had, great lady, uh, was the driving force. And Hillary uh, relates to what happened there in, at this declaration time. And she writes, they discussed, these people on that committee, they discussed, they wrote, they revisited, revised, rewrote. They incorporate suggestions and revisions from governments, organizations, and individuals around the world. It is telling that even in the drafting of the Universal Declaration, there was a debate about women's rights. 
So it was still not basically saying, well, of course. You know? The initial version, this is really a great, once in a while you find something you, know, that, that, that just, you can use like I do today. The initial version of the first article stated, all men are created equal. <laughs> Elizabeth, Katie Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony are rolling over in their grave. You know? It took women members of the commission led by Hansa Mehta of India to point out that all men might be interpreted to exclude women. Might. We have to be linguistically fair here. I, I need to make that statement. All men are create, create equal does not automatically exclude women. We can prove linguistically that men can include women. But we want, we want things nowadays more direct and more specific. Same, same linguistic problems, by the way, with German as well. But anyhow, might be interpreted to exclude women. Of course it might be interpreted that way. Only after long debate, she writes, was the language changed to say all, well, what, okay, what would you do? What would you say? Would you pick all men and women are created equal? Or, or, you, you, would, you, you would like you, humankind? I think I would have liked that, but they didn't choose that. Any other suggestions? People. People would be an obvious, obvious decision. They didn't choose that either. They chose all human beings are born. And interestingly enough, they go back to John Adams. All men and we all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. I don't know which one we would. People, humankind, I think, might well be maybe the one we could, could settle on, but still, they, they, as you can, say, can see, they, they, uh, they really uh, uh, worked on it. Well, you knew I was going to say something about Martin Luther King. Uh, Martin Luther, Luther King, and I brought my book on King over there, if you want to take a look at it. King had, look, he was a Baptist minister, trained in the Somalic tradition of the South, by his own father, smart man, PhD earned, uh, and uh, he used a lot of proverbs, religious proverbs, folk proverbs. His two favorites were uh, love thy enemy, solid Bible proverb, and uh, Matthew 544, and he liked all men are created equal like many others, but those are the two that really stand out. Now, on March 12, 1958, he gave a sermon called The Christian Doctrine of Man. Man spelled with, a, with an A, meaning the collective human race. See, my, ling, linguist, language is, is, a, is a complex system. Because we could immediately say, come on, Martin, why didn't you say the Christian doctrine of men and women, right? But he figured we would understand that he means it inclusively. Anyhow, he had that sermonic stroke of genius to have God talk through him to us. So he goes, he starts by saying, the God of this universe stands there in all of his love and forgiving power saying, now he's quoting God speaking to us. Come home, Western civilization. You have strayed away into the far country of colonialism and imperialism. You have taken 1,600,000,000 of your brothers in Asia and Africa, dominated them politically, exploited them economically, segregated and humiliated them. You have, transplant, you have trampled over them. Again, speaking to us, right, but Western civilization, if you will rise up now and come out of this far country of imperialism and colonialism and come on back to your true home, which is freedom and justice, I'll take you in. This God kind of giving us a break, you know. America, <laughs> this is kind of neat, America, I had great intentions for you, says God. <laughs> I had planned for you to be this great nation where all men would live together as brothers, a nation of religious freedom, a na nation of racial freedom. And America 
You wrote it in your Declaration of Independence. You meant well, for you cried out, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in the midst of your creed, America, you've strayed away to the far country of segregation and discrimination. You're taking 16 million of your brothers, trampled over them, mistreated them, inflicted them with tragic injustices and indignities. But America, I'm not going to give up on you. If you will rise up out of the far country of segregation and discrimination, I will take you in, America, and I will bring you back to your true home. No wonder Martin Luther touches all of us. Martin Luther King, I better say. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, to, to read, I read everything that Martin Luther King ever wrote, also speeches, everything. It is, it is, he was an artist, a linguist par excellence, but conscious. He worked on it, you know. Uh, now, President Obama, uh, in his, do you remember, uh, I was kind of disappointed, and I'm a real fan of Barack Obama, so you can see I wrote this book called Yes, We Can. <laughs> but uh, remember when he was on his way to his inaugural address, he stopped in Baltimore in Philadelphia. And I wish he hadn't done that, uh, because he basically gave his inaugural address both at Baltimore and at Philadelphia. So when he finally gave it, uh, it was, didn't come across, I don't think, as, 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 as powerful as it, as it should have. In fact, I'll, I'll make a little personal plea here. I, I wish, I don't know how you feel, but I can wait until our newest president gives his or her presidential address. I really don't need the pundits telling me two days prior what the president's going to say. Are we that impatient? It takes, it takes the joy away from that incredible event, if the press is already discussing the pros and cons of what is being said, you know. So that, that I think, is something we, we really, I think, could maybe be a, a little bit more patient. Anyhow, here's what he said. The early patriots were willing to put all they were and all they had on the line. One of President Obama's favorite proverbial expression, on the line. Their lives, their fortunes and their sacred honor for a set of ideals that continue to light the world. That all men are created equal. That our rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness come not from our laws but from our maker. And that our government of, see he, he knows exactly what to say. That our government of, by and for the people can endure. It was these ideals that led us to declare independence and craft our constitution, producing documents that were imperfect, but had within them, like our nation itself, the capacity to be made more perfect. And what's ringing in your head is the beginning of the constitution of the United States, in order to make a more perfect union. So another part of the speech. We remain a young country, Obama says. But in the words of scripture, the time has come to set aside childish things. That was a great linguistic rhetorical clue there to say, take, put away childish things. Let's quit bickering about in Congress, for example. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, to choose our better history, Right. To carry forward that precious gift, that noble idea, passed on from generation to generation, the God-given promise that all are created equal. Notice he didn't use men. I think that was conscious too. That all are created equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. So I think, I think those are very, very uplifting, uplifting 
statements. And I believe we are all aware of the fact that a president giving, again, his or her, one of these days, her uh, presidential inaugural addresses, uh, it is expected from that particular speech that there is certainly a bit of American flag waving and, and self praise, right? But I, I think uh, it is worthwhile to be a little bit careful with some of the exceptionalism thought that I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, even in a inaugural address, I wouldn't be too quick to say that we are the greatest country in the world. It doesn't need to be said, you can think it. No. How about Bernie, to wind up with? <laughs> oh, Bernie, is, he's just fine. Another good book to read is uh, Our Revolution, A Future to Believe in, that Bernie wrote in, in, in 2016. And um, I gave a speech about Bernie in Portugal last year. And I, I received a hero welcome. I mean, people, people in Europe, really, many people in Europe, really like, like Bernie Sanders. Remember, Western Europe is basically, are basically social democracies. So you shouldn't be at all surprised that, uh, that Bernie's uh, rhetoric was appealing for, for, many re for many reasons, but certainly in, in, in Europe. Uh, but listen to Bernie. Democracy is the right of a free people to control their destiny. Not a beautiful short <coughs> definition of democracy, really. Not kings or queens or czars but ordinary people who come together in a peaceful manner in order to determine the future of their society. Democracy means that the government belongs to all of us and that it is our inherent right to elect people who will represent our interests. After all, this is what our Declaration of Independence proclaims when it profoundly states, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, uh, and so on. Okay, so so basically, then he, he uses the, the same the same type of uh, language. And one more statement from Bernie: the idea that all Americans are created equal, nicely put. Huh? All Americans are created equal, and that all of us are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, according to the founders, supposed to be self-evident truth. And then he probably made a bit of a break when he, when he orally presented this and said, but those foundational notions about what this country is supposed to be all about are seriously imperiled by the grotesque level of wealth and income inequality that exists in America today. Yeah. So, so he uses our proverb that we're talking about to, 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 to point out that you know, we might be able to solve some of our racial issues, but we still have that tremendous economic split. And my, the title of my talk in Portugal was, Bernie's has two favorite proverbs. The one you can immediately think of, enough is enough. And if Bernie would listen to me, I would say to Bernie, Bernie could. Enough is enough. Try not to use that anymore. It gets a little bit tiring. But the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, that I think is the truth. That is something that our country needs to watch. You know. Uh, so um, anyhow, uh, uh, you can see how this one little short sentence is, uh, you know, it, it is something we should aspire to. We haven't by any, by any means reached. We haven't even talked about the gay community and all the rest. You know, right now we've only talked about black and white and women and men, but that's, there are many, many other issues uh, that, that uh, really uh, center around it. Uh, what time is it getting to be? Okay, so I brought a few slides if you would like to see how the proverb continues to live in, uh, well, more humorous 
way in advertising and so on. But of course, you could also say what a shame in a way that this particular statement is reduced to advertising jingles and so on. But I want to show you, I want to give you, before we do that, a couple of parodies. Anything that you and I use a lot, silent night, jingle bells, proverbs, eventually there's a tendency in us human beings to play with it, to parody it, to kind of make a little bit of a joke out of it. Uh, a serious one, but nevertheless a good one, comes out of George Orwell's uh, Animal Farm. You remember Animal Farm, 1945. I'll read, I'll read you the short passage. <clears throat> Benjamin, never mind him. For once Benjamin consented to break his rule, and he read out to her what was written on the wall. Do you remember what's written on the wall? You remember it. There was nothing there now except a single commandment. It read, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than ours. Right. So, so, so Orwell, Orwell was definitely uh, uh, parodying that. But look, look at Bernie. Bernie comes up with this. In recent elections, the concept of one person, one vote has been supplanted by the influence of big money. The more money you have, the more power you have. Some citizens participate in contributing hundreds of thousands of dollars to the politicians and parties of their choice. Most citizens contribute to money and do not vote. To paraphrase Orwell, some citizens are clearly a lot more equal than others. So he, he, uh, he, he knows how to entertain. I'll read you a few more. All men are born free and equal, but some of them grow up and get married. <laughs> Good day, good for Valentine's Day. <coughs> All men are born equal, but some of them outgrow it. I think about these things. Uh, out, outgrow it. All men are created equal, but necklines, waistlines, and hemlines show that women are not. <laughs> All men are created equal, especially twists. <laughs> uh, All men are equal, and the cynic thinks they are all equally bad. Well, all men are born equal, the tough job is to outgrow it. In nuclear, and now it becomes serious. In nuclear, warfare, in nuclear warfare, all men are created equal. That's not so nice. Right? <laughs> I think I can do this in front of a public audience, <coughs> a grown audience. In public hair baths, all men are equal, more or less. <laughs> I'll let you think about that. <coughs> Anyhow. Would you like to see a, a few slides? Yes. Are you still patient enough? Uh, okay, Bob, if we can turn the, the lights off. Uh, ah, the old man can bend down. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this. We can do this relatively quickly, by the way. Uh, I just want to show you. Uh, so, 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 we, so we basically we basically know the proverb, all men are created equal. So what you can do with any proverb, you simply take the keyword and say x. So all x are created equal. That's our formula. So now I can show you a whole battery of these that I've collected over the years. So all rates are not created equal. Right here from the Burlington Savings Bank. That doesn't exist anymore. I still remember buying my mortgage there. Uh, all Canadians are not created equal. So you can see the advertising people have fun with it. Uh, all pickups are not created equal. So uh, all Steinways aren't. Let me see if I can. This is going to annoy you. This is on automatic. Maybe we can. Maybe we can. Uh, let me stand here. Yeah. Uh, all maintenance-free batteries are not. This is almost silly, you know. Uh, but uh, all razors. All beards are not created equal, right? Uh, all shampoos are not created equal. If you see them in a series like that, it's almost ridiculous. I know that. All chemicals. All hotels. All feet. You know, now we're almost getting to the point of sacrilegious, you know? <laughs> uh, now we get all feet are not created equal. Those pictures. 
I hope you don't mind this one, a smaller condom because all men are not created equal. Uh, I think it was kind of an ingenious ad using those, what do you, what do you call those fruit? Uh, uh, galls, you know, that's <laughs> kind of. Uh, this one is funny too. I mean, this is a fruit of the, fruit of the loom underwear is getting into ladies' underwear. And so they say, uh, fruit of the looms, ladies' panties, because woman was created equal but different. And then they get into the spiel about that panties come in feminine styles, fabric, soft pistol colors that are all so different from our men's briefs. But they are created equal to quality, value, comfort, and long-lasting fit. And then you can get them as briefs and hipsters and bikinis and what else you know about women's underwear. So. Uh, yeah, uh, they had some fun with it. All glasses not created equal. Uh, all gold. So you can see the, 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 the proverb is not just in, prover in, in, in political rhetoric, but it plays a role in, in our community. Uh, Professor Major, what is your technique in drawing out of the cyber universe these particular oh, well, well, was, with yeah. the theme of how, ni how, nice of you, how nice of you to ask this. I'll, I'll quickly digress. I started at UVM in 1971, and I began to collect things like this. Magazines, I would go to various dentist doctor's offices and said, can I have the old magazines when you're done? And I leafed through them, cut them out, <coughs> kept them, and I, I have 10,000 slides like this. <laughs> Excuse me, you were fixed on the phrase created equal? Well, no, that's only one of them. I could come and do the same for others. Like yeah. or, or, or government of the people, I could show you slides like that. But you can see it takes a lot of time to collect stuff like I that. Yeah, so. yeah. But um, uh, it's, uh, you say fixed. My wife says obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my, you know, a folklorist, part of a folklorist is that you collect. You know, and you can tell, I really started all of this for my students because let's just say, I teach a class on folklore in advertising. How can a student in a matter of 13, 14 semester weeks collect all this stuff? So you could come to me and say, you know, Professor Nida, I always wondered about that proverb that plays such a big role in Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors, remember, 1914? And I could say, well, all right, look, I've al already collected a number of poem, poet, poems that deal with this problem. But I also have, by chance, about 25 cartoons, comic strips, advertisements. I can give all of that to you, and you then can go home and see what you can make out of it. That's what started it. You know. Anyhow, uh, thank you for that question. So we have all X's are created equal, or we can have the other formula, not all men are created equal. We can do this relatively fast. All three had cassette decks are created equal. Uh, not all dads are created equal. Mm -hmm. Sky is the limit, really. Not all electrical distributors are created equal. This one I never have understood. What do apples have to do with, created, with, 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 uh, with electrical distributors? Not clear to me. But remember, advertisements want your attention. The fact that they're playing with a formula that you know, as you flip through the magazine, you might just stop. And then you're supposed to read that, of course. Not all colleges are created equal. Poor Lincoln. Not all stereophones are created equal. This is the last one, but this is a beautiful one. And, and I'm so proud it happens to be come, come from my beloved UVM. So, what, what UVM was doing is they were advertising um, for summer trips that you could take. And it's important to know that one of the study trips was to Gettysburg. So there was a reason why. When I first saw this, I said, well, what a silly thing to do with Lincoln and the Gettysburg address. But it was done on purpose to advertise for this study trip. But look, four score and seven years ago, and then you can see uh, that uh, our phrase uh, is, is right here, the proposition that all men are created equal. So I think this was maybe an effective, effective advertisement if you caught on to it, what was being done. Right. 
Well, that's it. So let me just say a couple more things, maybe. Um, I really, I really have enjoyed your, enjoyed your, appreciate your question. Uh, you could ask me after I shut my mouth in two seconds. Uh, you could ask me and say, you know, Wolfgang, I've always wondered where does this particular proverb come from? Pick anyone, any you wish. If I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I happen to have written a book on it or an article. <laughs> and you know, I have a little trick. When a journalist does that to me, and let's just say they ask, whatever proverb, I know it of course, but I have never worked on it. Then I can always quickly say, well, yes, but you know, I have this, there's this other one that is much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but each, each proverb can really become its own research project. How old, how old is Don't Judge a Book by its cover, really? Let me play a trick with you. How old do you think the proverb is, a dog is man's best friend? If you, if, you, if you had to take a guess, did it exist in the Middle Ages? Does it go all the way back to classical antiquity, as many proverbs do? Is it in the Bible? It would um, go back to the Middle Ages because no. people were kind of savage towards their dogs. Look, we they were allowed, but they weren't. Yeah. Um, yeah. They weren't beloved, they weren't living yeah. living room. I would guess it's a 19th century. Um, I think I can go home. I'm not needed. <laughs> this is, this is, this is, this is, you know, this is, this is what makes all of this fun. You, you can, in a way, you can reason it out. You're absolutely right. A dog was a working animal, or a, or a wild beast, more or less. They happened to be running around, right? So it, a dog was not man's or woman's best friend. It was used for hunting purposes in, in, in cages and so on. So, so you're right, basically around uh, mid 19th century. Yeah. yeah. Could I ask a question? And He's going to ask that proverb that I know nothing about. I'm Watch him. Speaking, excuse me, everyone, for asking, taking three statements in a row. How All you, good things come in three. Uh, yeah, there's. <laughs> Uh, where are proverbs? What is a proverb? I came here with a question, and I could look you up and Google. No, I can tell you uh, now. And, but uh, you know, proverb is a certain kind of rhetoric, and I want to say I've been much uh, educated, and entertained by two kinds of rhetoric. This afternoon. First, a credit to you is professorial rhetoric. I'm long out of college, and I haven't heard it just standing at a podium for a very long time. So that's one distinct kind of rhetoric you brought to us. And the other, what you mainly spoke about, was the rhetoric of politics and statesmanship, which mostly I pass by. I'm glad you brought me to it. But uh, it's sort of windy stuff, even Lincoln's marvelous words. Yeah. And so they're talking in a different level of the stratosphere when they array to uh, a microphone or an audience of 10,000. So there are two rhetorics that I encountered, and it's been mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Your professorial rhetoric and the rhetoric of states. But standing outside of all of that is the type of rhetoric which proverbs are. And maybe you would come again and talk, yeah. you know, just about proverbs, the form of speech. I'll, 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 res I'll respond to it quickly. If you need it, if you need it, a quick, a quick working definition for there are hundreds of definitions for proverbs, by the way, from complex to simple. I'll give you a wonderful one that I use all the time as a working definition. A proverb is a concise statement. It has to be short, right? A concise statement. Now comes importantly of an apparent truth of something that is not always true but many times. Proverbs are not universal truths. Remember, out of sight, out of mind, and absence makes a heart grow fonder. So proverbs are not a philosophical system, but rather proverbs are apparent truths. They fit, and when they fit, we use them. And if they don't fit, we use another one, right? So a proverb is a concise statement of an apparent truth. And now comes one very, very important part which has currency. In other words, 
it has to be known by a group of people, not necessarily the whole in the United States, not necessarily all of UVM, but maybe the snowboarders. The snowboarders all know go big or go home. <laughs> so it's, it's a, we know this, it's a, it's a proverb that started about 20 years ago, out of the snowboarding folk group. It is becoming more and more a general American proverb. Right? But the thing with proverbs, to get to your real point, proverbs are, I'm going to use three fancy words and then I'll quit. Proverbs are multi-semantic. In other words, proverbs can have more than one meaning. <coughs> proverbs are multi-situational. Proverbs appear in all kinds of places. Politics, Shakespeare, Robert Frost, snowboarding, you name it. And they are multi-functional. You can use a proverb with your grandchild to teach her a lesson. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. There you have an old-fashioned educational didactic use of that proverb. But a humorist or a cartoonist can twist it around and use it in an absolutely ridiculous way. Right? So proverbs are absolutely not simple. And you can play with them in addition to it. Thank you all for coming.